Good afternoon and welcome to Education Today. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. Today, we're inviting you to call in to discuss education topics of importance to you and your community. The telephone number is 510-848-4425. That's 510-848-4425. I'm going to mention one big education issue that's happening right now in the Bay Area. And this is one you're welcome to speak to if you're interested. Otherwise, talk about whatever you'd like. One big education that's been involving me for the past year is the election of Oakland's new mayor, Ron Dellums. Exactly a year ago this week, a few of us got together to create what I believe is a unique o- Oakland coalition. We had members of Oakland's Black Caucus, including Jeffrey Peet, Gene Hazard, and a number of other people, some members of the Latino community, some labor people, some people from the Asian community, and many others. And we started something which was, I think, unprecedented in Oakland and maybe throughout the country. We decided to find and recruit the candidate we actually wanted for mayor rather than just voting for one of the people who had already declared their desire to run. So we started a petition campaign. We went around to festivals, grocery stores, churches, farmers markets, and we asked people to sign up to request that former Congressman Ron Dellums run for mayor. Amazingly, most people we asked signed our petition. That was about 8,000 people. Then we asked Congressman Dellums to have a press conference with us and tell us what he had decided. Wonderfully, in October of last year, he said yes. I had known Dellums when he was in Congress, and I was excited especially about his stands on international issues and civil rights, but I'd never really considered whether or not he had a position on education, since that wasn't one of the committees he was primarily on in Congress. As he started campaigning, I got to hear what he thought about education, and I was blown away by how knowledgeable and compassionate he was about youth. He knew about exit exams, he knew about the lack of after-school services, and he immediately took a position that Oakland should be back in under local control, which was something very important to me. His very first meeting was with young people, and one of the largest constituent groups of the campaign was something called Education for Dellums. Mr. Dellums also spoke out on script, scripted curriculum, lack of teachers, and many, many other issues. So one of the things you might want to address when you call in is how you think having Dellums in office could affect education in Oakland and throughout the Bay, or how you would like to have his candidacy and mayorship affect education around the Bay and throughout the state. What do you want to see happen that you think might be affected by having a new mayor in Oakland with a very expansive and inclusive program. The number again is 510-848-4425. And we're here to take your calls. One of the issues that came up very strongly in the uh, education discussion as we began uh, looking at issues in Oakland was the idea that there wasn't enough participation in making decisions. Um, and Mr. Dellums has promised that he would have a completely participatory administration, and he has proposed to set up dozens of task forces, which will look at all kinds of issues, not just education, but so that anyone who wants to be involved can have their voice heard on things like child care, uh, return of local control, financing of the district, the use of district property, and so many other issues that are of importance to teachers and, and to uh, parents. And so we're hoping and thinking that many of the thousands of people who worked on the campaign and others will want to get involved. So if you have something you'd like to comment on about education and issues in Oakland or anywhere else around uh, the Bay Area, please call in at 510 510- Eight four eight four four two five, and we have a call now from Patrick in San Francisco. Hello, Patrick. Are you there, Patrick in San Francisco? I am here. Hi, I'm, Patrick. Uh, I'm passing through the tunnel on the Bay Bridge. I oh. hope you can hear me, <laughs> and I break up. I can hear you. Let's see. Now I can't hear you. Coming to Oakland, I hope. I think we've lost you, Patrick. If you want to talk with us, please call back. Again, this is Education Today. 
This is Education Today, um, and we're talking about many issues, anything you'd like to discuss related to education, but one of the issues is what impact people might hope that the Dellums mayorship will have on education. And there's Leonard in Oakland. Hello, Leonard. Welcome to Education Today. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. My name is Albert Leonard, and uh, I'm a long-standing uh, friend of Ron Dellums. I've been knowing him since... 1950, and I know that he has a young mind and very good concepts, and I think that Oakland will do well on his stewardship. So I wish him well, and I'm, I'm overly enjoyed and impressed over the fact that you put together a committee to elect this man. Evidently, you're very intelligent, very wise, and have a lot of interest in the welfare and being of Oakland. Thank you very much, and I know that it will be improved by his leadership in Oakland. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Thank you so much for your comments. And we have Matt uh, calling in from Oakland. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just have one question for you, and I'll, then I'll just hang up and listen on the air. What was wrong with Nancy Nadell? How come you passed her over in favor of Dellens? You know, um, one of the things that was really important about the Dellums campaign, both his own approach and the feeling of people who were uh, working on his campaign, was that we were actually not running against anybody. We were just running for things that we thought um, he, with his unique vision and experience and kind of expansive approach, would be able to bring to Oakland. And actually, I wrote one of the early uh, columns in a newspaper about why I thought he should run and said in that column that I thought there were several other candidates who were very good, people I liked very much. But I just thought that the possibility of being able to actually win and also have a great vision was, was most likely something that Congressman Dellums would bring. So it wasn't really an opposition to anybody, and I hope that everybody will work together. We need everybody on board to make Oakland into a really fully vibrant uh, city, which we think it can be. There Now we have on the line Richard in San Francisco. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. I have a question regarding um, a piece that came out in the Chronicle yesterday, uh, sort of uh, delineating uh, a city that is about binaries, rich and poor. Uh, and I'm really curious whether Education Today at some point is going to be able to talk about how the wealth gap affects education, particularly in urban areas. Uh, thank you for your question. It's really interesting. We sat down to have an editorial meeting yesterday and laid out uh, the program of programs we're planning for the next few months. And very high on the list is the question of the wealth gap and what effect it has both on education and also on the demographics of cities and how they people get displaced from the city. Um, I think the wealth gap is really important in education, and I think it's... I'm just going to make a couple comments on it right now, and then we'll, we hope to cover it in greater detail very soon. But um, I think that it's an overlooked uh, impact on education. There's a tendency to look at the correlation between income and test scores, and then sometimes to be surprised by the test scores when looked at that way. But actually, there's an absolute correlation between wealth and test scores. And because of the history of the United States, the wealth gap falls along racial lines because of slavery, redlining, Jim Crow laws, and continuing discrimination. Um, both African Americans, Latinos, and Asians have less accumulated family wealth than whites in, on the median. In fact, it's about an eight to one, uh, proportion for the median family income, or wealth, I'm sorry. And, uh, because of those statistics, uh, you can see a very great correlation in what happens in schools. So we need to look hard at that and, um, take a little bit more real view of, of how enormous the, uh, the gap is in the United States and, and what we can do about it. So thanks for bringing up the question. We do intend to deal with it, definitely. Thank you. Uh, one more comment to the last caller. There's a really good, there are a couple authors who write on this, uh, subject. Dalton Conley is one, Oliver and Shapiro, I'm sorry I've forgotten their first names right this minute, but they've written on it. So if people are interested in the subject, you might get their books uh, or look up on the websites uh, what, what they have to say about this. And our next caller is David. Welcome to Education Today. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I, before I, I say anything, I just want to say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't want to be adversarial, and I'm, I consider myself a... A very progressive liberal Berkeleyan, born and raised, and raised in all the Berkeley schools, and, and I believe we need a Marshall Plan for the inner city and the inner city youth, and 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 all that. 
But listening to mainstream conversations on this issue, and there is a lot on mainstream radio, especially uh, about education, I just kind of wanted to get your response to some of the points that I often hear the right make. Um, the first point is that um, the state of California spends over 50% of the state budget on education already, and yet uh, the accusation is that people on the left are constantly screaming for more money. Um, so I kind of wanted to get your feeling about that. Second of all, that uh, that the, the schools are not necessarily the place to try to remedy uh, problems that originate in the home, where you have uh, a lack of interest in education, no real uh, ethic of, of uh, learning in the home, um, no real uh, encouragement or development of a child in the home. And so a, a child is often put in, uh, say, kindergarten without even... Uh, the skills, even and or kindergarten, um, and so you have this this tiered uh, effect within the schools, even from very very early ages. Um, there are some some uh, what would be controversial proposals, even to have an entrance exam for young children, um, uh, be, so that you don't have this stratification within the schools. And if people are not ready to even enter the education process, um, how about put them in a remedial? Um, uh, the boot camp for school, for instance, or some something like that. Uh, a preschool exam. I know these are controversial and, and uh, provocative issues, um, but uh, and then finally the exit exam controversy and why we can't even establish a minimal standard for exit exams and why is that so controversial on the left? So I'll, I'll take your response on the on the those three points are uh, we already spend fifty percent of the budget on education. Um, what about the problem uh, that originates in the home and parents that aren't involved, parents that don't care, uh, no ethic of learning, and, and uh, preschool exams and exit exams? Uh, thank you for your questions. I think they're real important, and they do provide a lot of provocative possibilities for, for uh, discussion. On the question of money, um, to argue that the state spends 50% of its budget on education is just what else should the state spend money on? When you look at the overall budget of the whole United States, including both state budgets and the net federal budget, the proportion is very small. And in California, actually, per capita income in, in California, actually, our spending on education is quite small. Um, and students, young people have many, many needs in school. Actually, in proportion how much the knowledge economy has grown, our education budgets have grown by no means as much. Uh, what it means to say this is a knowledge economy is to say that the amount, the depth, the breadth of what people need to know in the United States is enormous, and um, and our spending is by no means uh, kept up with that. And I think, you know, if you visit most schools, particularly in urban communities, you can see that there's not a lot of money going to waste. Actually, you know, teachers are working for quite low salaries. Their benefits are not that good, particularly recently. And uh, students don't have the kind of services they need. So um, so I think you got to look at the overall spending of the whole country. Um, the second, On the second issue, I think that, um, you know, the one of the things that's gone wrong in American education, particularly over the last few years, is the idea that kids are supposed to come to school already having a lot of academic knowledge. And in other countries and in earlier times in the U.S., we assumed that the school was supposed to teach you what you needed to know. You weren't supposed to learn all these academic skills at home. The school was responsible for that. And that's still the case in many other countries. And so the idea that your parent is supposed to teach you a lot of academic skills is one of the things that disenfranchises lots of kids. In contrast, in other countries, I'm just going to give one contrast, and it's probably a subject we ought to discuss in greater depth on this program. But in Scandinavia, in some countries, it's illegal to start teaching a child to read before the age of six. And the reason is because they're actually following what developmental psychologists have found out, which is that kids, all kids aren't ready to read before the age of six. So if you start forcing kids to learn to read in school at age four or five, many of them aren't ready. They're just not physically ready. It's not a matter of something wrong that their parents have done. They're not ready. Uh, and so then when you start making them do something many of them aren't ready to do, then you, you know, immediately and automatically start dividing kids up and making some of them feel like they're incompetent. 
uh, when there's nothing wrong with them. It's just a biological thing. Actually, this, the uh, Scandinavian countries I'm talking about actually have much higher literacy rates in the United States, and it's my view that we actually create our own literacy problems, that a big part of the reason why we have so many illiterate people in spite of our big educational system is that we make people feel incompetent by having expectations that are unrealistic and which we're not prepared to help them with. And lastly, on the exit exam, you know, there aren't even enough teachers in the schools. California California does not credential enough teachers to uh, teach the topics students are required to pass on the exit exam. So even if you believe there was some level of skills kids should have when they graduate from high school, if you don't provide the instruction and those skills, it's clearly unfair to require them. Um, thank you for those questions, and I hope we'll be able to go into all of them in more depth. The phone number again for education today, we're taking call in today, 510-848-4425, and we have Jean on the phone from Oakland. Uh, thank you for taking my call. And I feel like I can address some things that the previous caller um, had questions about. Um, I was a teacher in the Oakland School District uh, for many years and taught at Roosevelt Junior High. Um, I had done my teacher training at Cal State Hayward where I taught the middle school using a particular textbook, and when I went into uh, the junior uh, high in Oakland, the students were not equipped to deal with that textbook, which the children in Castro Valley could read with ease. And it broke my heart because I felt, here I am in my community, um, and I can already see this separation beginning to take place between the communities. And um, I feel that uh, Oakland has a history of um, hiring teachers who come from out of state, who have uh, lower um, demands made on their credentialing so that they could pay those teachers less money. So there's a financial aspect to what you're talking about. Um, I don't think there's a parent in... Uh, the community who uh, doesn't care about their children and wouldn't give to their children if they had uh, the time and uh, the maybe a little less fatigue from holding down too many jobs in order to uh, try and take care of their children. So I would uh, ask for maybe a little bit more compassion um, as we talk about how we can educate children. Thank you for your thoughts. I think you're making a good point. My experience, I was a high school teacher in Oakland for 10 years, and I've been teaching teachers since then. And I agree with you. They're, they're, you know, Parents of every social class care about their kids, and probably parents with less money care more about education than parents with more money because they have no other option. They're only option for the possibility that their children might be able to earn more money or have uh, a better chances uh, economically is education. And so I find, you know, working class parents enormously interested in education. Yeah. But it's more, you know, it's more difficult if you haven't been successful in school yourself in terms of learning, you know, these advanced subjects that are now required of kids. You don't feel like you can teach those things to your kids. And if then if there are no teachers to teach them either, which is, you know, I think a responsibility of the state, then what are you supposed to do? You end up in a real frustrated situation. So I agree well, with your comments. And, Thank and you. And I would just like to bring maybe one last thought, and that is that uh, it might be helpful for the people in the educational community to uh, look at those Scandinavian countries you're talking about, because many of them are using the Waldorf system of education, and they do not want children to begin doing intellectual work. That does not mean that they are not learning. They may be cooking and painting and digging in a garden instead of learning A, B, C. That really good point. Those physical things develop the brain. Very, very good point. Take good care now. Thank you so much. Thank and, you for your time. And I hope while we're going through this participatory process in Oakland that we'll be able to look at some of those models. And I think one of the things the education p people would like to do is to figure out what really would a wonderful, enriching, encouraging education look like, both for little kids and older kids. What would that look like? What are we really aiming for? Because Part of what we're missing, I think, in you know, among progressives is a vision of what we want. What do we think education should be like? We complain and argue against the implementation of a lot of 
you know, a lot of testing and, and we're right, but we need our own vision. So um, uh, hopefully that kind of uh, looking at the models that you're talking about will be part of coming up with that. Uh, we have another caller. Uh, let me give the phone number again before I answer the next call. The number is 510-848-4425. And this is um, KPFA. The program is Education Today. And my name is Kitty Kelly Epstein. And we have Michael in Oakland. Great show. Great answers to you. You almost answered all the things I wanted answered. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the, the expectations are a big thing. I mean, the, uh, you have these big expectations, but no way do you ever accomplish them in life from the, you know, what they sort of teach us in school. Uh, I've got a, uh, one that's got to go three more years in high school. I'm worried about the exit exam. Is there any maybe web pages that where there's a strategy to overcome this situation that only really affects 10%? And in reality, uh, all by that time, so many people have dropped out. Um, and then, um, oh, there was another question. I lost it. But uh, I'm worried about the exit exam. How can we beat this thing? I, I don't see we're going to be able to do it through uh, the courts and things like that. It has to be done by the students, I think. I think you're... I think you're right uh, that the student involvement is going to be really important. People you know the the progress that we made around civil rights and human rights issues uh, in education came has always come about mostly because young people get involved and they say this is intolerable, it's not fair, it doesn't look right, and we're not going to take it. So I I agree with you that that's going to be the main force, and hopefully there'll be some adults involved in it too. There is a state of California website. I don't have the um, the web site yeah. address right now but there is one and at least up until a few months ago last time I looked at it they had some sample questions on there from the exit exam well, so what? I think you can get some samples if you're concerned about your own child situation which yeah. is certainly something to be concerned about and then uh, there are some organizations that are fighting the exam I know Californians yeah. for Justice has been involved in that and there's a New York organization called Fair Test they have a website uh, www.fairtest.org I think which provides a lot of information on testing that Nationally. Do you have the numbers as far as a private school, like in Oakland versus a public school? You know, it's the private school don't test. Well, that's the that's the interesting point. Also, private schools, by and large, don't require credentials, and they don't require standardized tests. And so, it's interesting that the people who are policymakers, who generally have the most accumulated wealth, again. Uh, are imposing a certain system of education on children who don't have a lot of accumulated wealth and yet for their own children they send to schools that don't have any of that system in place at all. They choose their teachers on the basis of being caring people who know their own subject and are able to care, convey it to kids and to be nurturing. And uh, there are many of those people who can't get through the credential hoops and I actually do teach a credentialing myself and while I do think there's a lot to learn about teaching, I'm not saying you don't need to learn anything, but this particular set of bureaucratic regulations doesn't bring the most warm, loving, knowledgeable people into teaching. It, it actually sets up quite a few barriers, I think. So thank you for your comments and your call, and uh, I hope if you're in Oakland or interested in these issues, we'll be able to work with you also. Earl uh, calling from Oakland. Hi, Earl. Hey, Kitty, this is your boy. Hi there. How you doing? I'm doing well. So are you. I'm actually calling... Uh, everybody pretty much made a good point. I wanted to kind of piggyback on um, on Gene's uh, point about the teachers coming in who were coming in for the wrong reasons from different places. Uh, I think that it it kind of hinders the process of, of uh, the students learning because well, it, it's not really the it's not the teachers; it's the premise for which they're coming. Uh, a lot of them are coming to get their loans paid off. I mean, that's the bottom line. And you have some teachers who are from this area who are Oakland bred and born or California bred and born who really have a heart to, to teach. But the barrier is what you were talking about, the bureaucracy of trying to get a credential in. And so it doesn't matter if their heart is good or if they are if they have a BA or a master's in a particular subject. Uh, they have to have that credential. Um, and what it, what it does is it... It puts a disparity there, and then you start to see less and less uh, representation of who is in that that student's community, and uh, less and less of people who uh, understand what the students are going through in the in the educational field. So, I mean, um, you know, I, I I was listening, and you know, some things I agree with, some things I didn't, but I think that honestly, um, when we look at the people who really want to make the changes that are going to be done. Uh, I look at you. I look at Ron Dellums. 
uh, they're either going to do it or they're not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be kind of like, you know, either you do it or you don't. And if you don't do it, then you got to get out. You know, if, if teaching isn't for you, then you got to, you know, you got to hit the road, Jack. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you, Earl. I appreciate your comments. I think the program Earl was talking about at the beginning might be some of these Teach for America type programs. And a lot of good people do come through those programs. I have nothing against the work they do or their talents or whatever. But it is a program that allows you to pay off student loans and get out in two years. And some people stay, I mean, I, some of my favorite teachers are people who went through Teach for America and stayed in urban teaching. But there are a whole lot of people who don't. And it takes you two years to be really good at working with the kids. So I think, um, you know, that it's, it's something districts are forced into because they don't have teachers who can meet the hoops. So then they have to go to these programs where people are basically temporary and leave quickly. Um, we have a last caller, Judith in Oakland. Hi, Judith. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of volunteer teaching in different Oakland schools, and uh, I think that your discussion all sounds an awful lot like people who haven't actually been in the school, because what I've seen is that the, a lot of the children, it's not that they don't have fancy academic help at home, it's that they actually can't sit still, and they don't know how to sit down and be quiet, and the teacher has to spend a lot of time teaching them basic skills, um, many of the kindergarten children actually can't uh, speak a straight sentence or line up for something or anything like that. So, and there is a tremendous problem in the Oakland Public Schools with the parents not being involved, being on drugs, uh, lots of very, very many one-parent families. Um, and I think that it's going to be ridiculous if all this if it if all evolves into a different, you know, arrangement of the teachers or arrangement of the test or arrangement of this or arrangement of that, and nobody actually faces the real problem, which is that the children are not ready to learn when they when they walk in the schools. And I've been to, you know, six or eight or ten, maybe ten of the public schools over a long period of time, and I've I really see it myself. Uh, I appreciate your comments. I think there are lots of parts to what you're saying. Um, uh, one question really is, again, you know, whether w how much sitting down kids should be doing at a particular age in life. And um, and then another is, you know, the reality, which I agree with, that uh, there are lots of parts to making education work for kids. And one is the conditions of, of families and communities as far as well, their... parents are the first teachers of any child, whether it has nothing to do with math or it's all of the skills of listening, caring about other people, being honest, not hitting someone, and all those things that you should come ready, you know, to, to learn. Then you're ready to learn the academics. And unfortunately, what I've seen is that there are lots of children in the open public schools who just don't have that basic training from their homes, and the teacher whatever their method is, wherever they're from, however many years of training, they they have to start, they have to spend a huge amount of their time training the child to do those basic things, which is, is the parent's job. Well, you know, um, I appreciate your comments. We are going to have to wrap up. We'll have a little bit more discussion on that question. My experience in schools uh, with kids of all social classes, whether they're a city or suburban schools, is that there's a lot of work for little kids to do at age four and five and a lot of arrangements, both in their seats and out of their seats, and, and that all parents are basically doing about the best they can at that particular moment in their life and experience. And I really appreciate everybody who's called in today. Um, you're listening to Education Today. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. Our next program will be in two weeks on Friday at 2.30. That will be our regular schedule. If you have regular, if you have questions regarding today's program, you can email us at educatetoday at earthlink.net. That's educate today at earthlink.net. The producer for this week's show is Lawton Chen. The board op for today's show is Nick Alexander. The producer for education today overall is Kevin Cartwright. Our technical producer is Lawton Chan. And I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein, hoping to see you in two weeks on Friday at 2.30. Thank you again for your for listening and for calling in.